Hello, dear friends. I am in front of the U.S. Capitol here in Washington, D.C., and I am about to show you that you can find food growing freely and abundantly even here on this manicured lawn and around the concrete. Indeed, there is even food growing here. I'm going to introduce you to some beginner's tips on how you can get foraging and introduce you to about a dozen of my different plant friends. Join me here at the U.S. Capitol to find food growing freely and abundantly. Let's go. Today is day 30 of living completely off of the food that I've foraged from the land. And overall, I feel great. It's been an excellent month. I've foraged about 100 different plants from Wisconsin to New York City as I've been traveling here from my wild rice, which actually I have a little bag of wild rice here. And we're going to do a little offering. So if you want to take part in the offering, as I'm giving this little introduction, just go ahead and take a few grains of this wild rice or monomen from the bag, and then we'll wait to do a little offering together. So you can just pass the bag around. And monomen, wild rice, has been one of the most important plants. It's been my staple food, and it is a plant that I foraged in the homeland of where I'm from which is uh, Anishinaabe land, or some people have heard of the English word Ojibwe or Chippewa. And so one thing that I want to acknowledge is that today we're on, we're foraging on stolen land, land that is here. It is what it is today because of genocide that happened, you know, a couple hundred years ago, but still continues to happen here in what we call the United States, also called Turtle Island. And so I think it's a really important thing to acknowledge that and acknowledge the land that we're on and start to reconnect with that. Because if we're out foraging and we're connecting to these plants, but we're not connecting to the history of this land, that's a pretty big, important part of, of for me, equality and justice and regeneration of our earth and community. And so one thing that I want to share is that today we are going to joyously learn some new plants. We're going to make some new plant friends. But I would not be here today if this was just about foraging. For me, foraging is ultimately it's an act of resistance in a dominator culture where, you know, what we have here called the United States, we have these ideas of societal norms or societal stigmas. And it's like, you do things this way. And the global industrial food system is part of that. What we've seen is the monocropping of our plant relatives into just a very few number of foods that we'll find at the grocery store. And today you're gonna meet a lot of, well, you're gonna meet some plants that you probably have never heard of before that you'll never find in the grocery store. And so foraging is an act of resistance because it's saying to big ag and to these big corporations, hey, we don't actually need you. We know that the food is growing freely and abundantly all around us. And we can find the most nutritious food that grows on earth and delicious food that grows on earth. And we can do this without money. We can do this together as a community while building our resources and our skills. So, there's so much more that I can say about that, but I just do really want to say that this is about so much more than just eating wonderful foods and finding our medicines. Besides food, we're also going to be finding medicine today. And one of the you know, things that we've gotten disconnected from in this current society is that our food is our medicine. There's that old saying of, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy, be thy food. And that's exactly what I've been doing over the last month. And that's what I did during my year of living 100% on food, uh, the food that I either grew or foraged. So we're also learning about the medicines of the plants today that are growing around us. And when we're tied into this fast food, you know, global industrial food system, that food actually we're finding makes a lot of us sick rather than it being our medicine. It's what creates, uh, is that, is that everyone? It creates an environment where we actually need medicine to take care of ourselves because of that food. So one of the big pictures of this today is we're finding food that with every bite actually heals us. So did everybody get a little bit of wild rice or monomen? 
I'll show it for the people that are out there on the internet. So um, what we're going to do is just give a, a little bit of gratefulness to the land and offer this as a little offering to the land. So just returning this little bit of manoman or wild rice to the earth and giving gratitude and thanks to the land. And for me, it's, it's just the action of taking the moment to live in gratitude. And one of the other big elements of today is, um, is just being grateful. Plants really, really are a wonderful way to tune in and be grateful. We, we kind of live in this world where we kind of never have enough when it comes to money and things like that. But once you, be, once you become friends with the plants, you kind of have everything you need because there's just so many out there. So a couple of things before we go out and meet some of the plants. I know that a lot of you are wondering this big question of how do you not die when you're foraging? How many of you have seen uh, Alexis Nicole? She goes by the Black Forager. She's, uh, she's got like 4 million followers on TikTok and on Instagram. And that's how she signs off every video with don't die. And there's a reason why. I think it's because a lot of people assume that they might die if they're trying to harvest, you know, foods. I'm just going to take a little drink. This is sumac aid with goldenrod. Mm -mm. Um, oh, also, to keep you all entertained as we continue these into the ethics, this is some sea salt. I just harvested this. Uh, I harvested the water, boiled it down to make salt. And if you'd like to try some homemade sea salt, I'll pass that around and you can have a pinch. It's got a bit of an oceany flavor to it. So the number one rule of foraging before we go out and meet the plants, and we'll just talk for about three more minutes and then we'll go out and meet the plants. Um, the number one rule of foraging is simply only eat something if you're 100% sure of what it is. That is how you don't die and that's how you don't get sick. And people ask me like that question on, on the internet all the time, like how do you know which plants are edible? Well, because you learn which plants are edible. Just like you would learn a sport or music or dance or anything you're in class for or how to walk. You learn it, you practice it. And so as far as the plants goes, the idea is we, we're disconnected from the plants because our society has not taught the, us this. And what we have to do is we have to learn them before eating them. So a few tips for that. Number one, one plant at a time. A lot of people, they look out into this beautifully green world and they feel intimidated because they're like, how do I, how do I figure out which plants to eat when there's so many plants? So my recommendation is you learn one plant at a time. It's very overwhelming to try to learn all of them. You couldn't do it. But if you focus on learning one plant at a time, like today, for example, you'll learn dandelion. Maybe that's your plant. Or we're going to talk about ginkgo and maybe that's your plant. So just learn one plant at a time and then you can take it slow. You can take it safely and you can make sure that you're ethically foraging. A note on that is if you want to, you know, really start to learn a lot more plants, one of the things you can do is you can learn one plant per month. And if you do that and you do that for one year, after a year, you'll know 12 plants. If you could work with 12 different plants as food and medicine, that would be quite something. For most of us here, that would be a lot compared to today. Actually, on that note, how many of you would consider yourself beginners to foraging? Cool. So almost all of us. How, is there anyone here that is like kind of a really knowledgeable forager or anybody who's like a foraging teacher by chance? All right. Well, my friend Eric Joseph Lewis is going to be joining us for the last half hour. You'll get to meet him. He's a plant wizard. And so that's what I was going to say is if you want to really become a plant wizard, you can learn one plant per week for a year. If you do that, you'll know 52 plants. Imagine, you know, how many of your friends know 52 plants? Just by learning one a week, which is something you can do in your spare time, spending even just 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes or, or a cup, cup, you know, couple hours a week 
doing something fun, you can become a plant wizard compared to the muggles around you in one year. So, you know, my suggestion is take it, take it slow, one step at a time. And then as far as some of the ethics of foraging, I'll sprinkle that in as we're meeting some of the different plants. But, well, one of the keys to ethical foraging is getting to know the plants. Each plant has a different way of interacting with the, work, with the earth, the way that it grows, where it lives, how long it's alive, how it pr produces fruit or seed. And so the, <clears throat> the real way to forage ethically is to get to know each plant and learn about it. So for example, in here I have sumac aid, which is the sumac, the fruit of sumac, which has those red spikes, those red spiky like clusters on top of them. And that you can harvest to your heart's content. You're just gonna pinch those off. Those spread by, uh, mostly by, by their roots rather than by seeds. So you can harvest this to your heart's content. Goldenrod is the other plant inside of here. And when I pick goldenrod, what I do is I just pinch some of the tops off and I leave some of them there. That way there's some for the bees and the butterflies and some to continue the life cycle. So each plant you'll learn, but as you get to know more and more, you'll start to reconnect with, with um, how to forage ethically. But there's a lot of plants that you can forage extremely sustainably. Anybody who tells you that it's destructive to forage is someone who just really doesn't know what they're talking about. Because the truth is, is that people who start to forage are people who start to want to protect the land because they have a connection with the plants. All right, I officially feel like I have talked way too much and we got to meet some plants. So I was going to do this whole thing where I was going to have you all take like five steps and then stay, say stop and then say, what plants have we already, what, what foods and medicines have we walked over? But I don't want you to step on these beautiful mushrooms here and I feel like they might get trampled on. So we won't do that. So I'm gonna start right here. Let's look down at the ground. Does anybody see a food what, or what they think might be a food or medicine within this you know, little circle of people we have here? Clover. We see clover, all right, that's one. This is clover here and you can see this leaf. You've all probably heard of you know, the idea of looking for a four leaf clover. So most clovers are three leaves. And if you look around, you'll probably find one by your feet, but you see this large cluster of them over here. And then we have the clover flower right here. So the two species of clover that you'll come across are the red clover and the white clover. So as far as how you can work with this plant, a, a common thing is you'll find clover tea. So you can make tea from the clover. Red clover tends to be used more. And then also in the springtime, you can suckle on these and there's a little bit of nectar in there. That's something I've been doing since I was a little kid. And you can just suckle that little nectar out and it's nice. There's not really nectar this time of year. So the red clover is the more desirable one for making tea and you can eat these leaves too. That being said, I'm starting off with a plant that is not exactly delicious. It's a fine plant. It's a great one to know. Every forager, you know, knows this plant more or less. So it's a great one to know, but it's not one that I eat a lot of. It's not one that I work with a lot. The, the clover tea though is one that is a staple for a lot of people. It's a very healthy tea. Um, however, clover is not one you're going to eat endless amounts of because it's in the pea family, which some of them have, alkaloids in them, toxic alkaloids, but nibbling on some of this is not an issue at all. It's just not one you eat in large quantities in your salad bowls. So let's see, any else th other things on clover? Well, I think one thing that I want to mention is clover is what's called a weed. You've probably all heard that term before. Today we're going to meet a lot of plants that are considered to be weeds. And I just want to say that weed is just a human-made concept. There is no such thing as a weed by 
nature's standards. Every plant has its place and its purpose. And the truth is, is that most of the plants that are considered to be sort of the bane of humans' existence are almost, they're almost always a food or a medicine. So clover is a nice plant to get to know. Um, the other plant that we have right here is, this is called creeping charlie or ground ivy. So everybody see if you can find one of these growing around you. And give it a smell. And feel free to harvest one of these. They get mowed and I'm assuming they'd get mowed soon anyway. So no harm in harvesting one of these. Give it a nice smell. And so there's a whole cluster of them over here if anybody wants to come over here to get some. These tend to grow in more moist areas, so you're going to find them more in the dips. So if you found one, give it a smell. Quite a unique smell, right? Like really strong, almost like, almost like too strong in a way. But this is a really nice medicine. So when I was traveling down to Birmingham, Alabama this summer, I had a cold and I, I happened to be going to stay with some herbalists at a place called Walden Pharmacy. That's F-A-R-M-A-C-Y instead of P-H, Walden Pharmacy. They gave me ground ivy tincture. And what a tincture is, is that's just different plants that are put into alcohol and the alcohol pulls out the medicines. And so that's a very simple thing that you can make. You can make your own tinctures and ground ivy tincture is one of the ones that they gave me. Now, if you want to try ground ivy, it's got a, a flavor that I can't describe. It's very strong. Um, truly no words to describe it. It's, I guess, ground ivy. It tastes like ground ivy. That's the only thing that I know. So this is one you can add to your salad bowls. You can throw some of this into your juice if you're juicing greens. You can saute this and um, it's a common one. You'll find this in most yards and all around. So this is again ground ivy or creeping charlie. The plant that looks the most like it is violet and hopefully we find some violet today as well and violet's also edible but that plant you can eat tons of because it's very mild. Any questions on clover or ground ivy? Really good. Oh, oh was, someone likes that. What was the tincture for? Like, what would, what would, uh, effect yes, so the question was, what was the tincture for? What, what's the medicine of it? And so I don't actually know. I just listened to the pharmacists, <laughs> the, the herbalists, which is often what I do. However, what I'll say is that the medicines that I tend to work with are what I consider sort of generalist medicines. So um, this is a medicine for me, the goldenrod. How I make tea from goldenrod is I just harvest the heads. So I just will harvest the heads, both the green and the flower. And then I will put them into a cup and I'll pour boiling water or close to boiling water over them and let it steep for three to five minutes. One thing that it's commonly used for is people think they're allergic to goldenrod, but actually what they're most likely allergic to is ragweed, and this actually helps to alleviate the allergic reaction to ragweed. So that's one of the things that it's good for. So this is a wonderful one that you can be harvesting right now through the fall. Okay, let's, um, let's go for, let's start walking finally and See what we find? We're gonna walk right over here to some of these trees. Dandelion is one that I really just absolutely have to share. I mean, it's one of the most, to me it's one of the most important plants of, of my life. And to so many people it's a plant that they try to eradicate from their yard, that they try their hardest to destroy. And here we are at the US Capitol, which definitely is trying pretty hard to make this just a monocrop of, of grass. But here the dandelion stands. It's an incredibly resilient plant. No matter how tr hard society tries to destroy it, it, it is here and it is here in huge quantities as food and medicine. So it stands by us as a wonderful plant ally. And 
the entire plant is food and medicine. So a lot of, a lot of you probably know that the flower, that the, the leaf is edible. And one, the main reason that people probably don't eat dandelion is because it's bitter. So I have a trick on how you can make dandelions not bitter anymore. And it's just eat them every day and eventually you'll get used to them and they won't be bitter anymore. <laughs> it really works. As your palate is liberated from the global industrial food system and it tastes all these new flavors like the ground ivy and the dandelion, your palate will adjust to it and over time these flavors that you once like cringed for, you will actually start to crave. And I crave bitters. One thing that I want to say about bitters is bitter is a sign of medicine. Now, bitter doesn't mean it's edible. There's bitter toxic plants and there's bitter edible plants. But when they're bitter and edible, it's a sign of medicine. Lettuce in the grocery store is the opposite of the resilient dandelion in my mind. Because what's happened to the lettuce, at no fault of the lettuce, actually wild lettuce is an incredible plant that I eat a lot of and it's bitter. What's happened to the domesticated lettuce is they've bred the bitterness out of it because the U.S. American palate is one of white bread, of the lack of flavor. And so what's happened by doing that is they've also bred the nutrients out of it and the medicine out of it. And they've bred a plant that needs pesticides in order to protect it. But how it protected itself before was the bitterness. So by being bitter, the plant can still be eaten, but not overeaten. So it protects itself, but still allows it to be food and medicine to other animals. So um, the other way that you can reduce the bitterness though, and this is for real, this isn't a joke, is you just saute it, you heat it up. And by doing that, you decrease the bitterness. And the same goes for the other strong flavored greens. So what I like to make is something called horta, which is a Greek word, which means like a mess of different cooked greens. So what you do is you take your different greens, you chop them up, and then you saute them in olive oil, and then you add lemon and salt. Very simple. It's a way to eat a whole lot of greens. And um, I like to eat raw greens, but when it comes to foraging with a lot of the stronger flavors, I'm able to eat a lot more greens and get a lot more nutrients in by cooking them. So I add a lot of them to soups and stews. Um, sometimes I juice, but mostly it's sauteing or blanching is the other thing I do, which is you just put, you just, uh, put them into a pot, pour boiling water over them, and then let that sit for about a minute. And when the leaves actually have turned brighter green, you take them out and the nutrients are then more available and more digestible. You don't leave them in until they turn like a bland green, it's while they're brighter green. So would I eat this dandelion? Yes. Did I just consume some pesticides? I'm guessing so based on where we are right now. Am I worried about that? No, but would I make a habit of eating these dandelions as my staple diet? I would not do that. I would go to areas where less pesticides are sprayed. But I really wanted to come here to the capital because I just thought it would be wonderful to see what's growing here and I thought it would be a very interesting place to end the month of eating from the land. And I will say, normally I do not check the places out in advance but I was worried, so I got here a couple hours early to see if there actually would be any food. And it only took me about 20 minutes to find over 10 different foods and medicines. So even here, food and medicine exists. We're gonna meet oak, but we're gonna go meet the magnific magnificent giant white oak back there in a moment. This is a, a little, lovely little oak here. So let's continue. Oh, okay. Another note on dandelion, of course. The leaves are edible. The flowers are edible. The stems of the flower, so this flower has already gone, you know, you know the yellow dandelion flowers. This is already flowered and it's already in its seed stage and it hasn't opened up yet. But the stem, 
is also edible. The milk inside of that, edible. And then the roots are edible as well. And how you work with the roots as medicine is you dig up the roots, you roast them. I like to chop them up first, roast them in a pan or in the oven until they're like crispy dry where you can basically break it. They're brittle. That means you've removed all the moisture. They will store long term that way for years. You can just put them into jars or bags. And then you, then you, well, then what I like to do is grind them in a blender, but you don't have to do that. And it turns into basically like what looks like coffee sort of, and it's used as a coffee substitute. It's not caffeinated, but it does have a nice aroma and it has a nice flavor. So it's got that nice morning like kick to it. And what you can, uh, the other roots you can do this with are, so dandelion, burdock, chicory, and dock. You can do the same exact process of just digging up the roots, chopping them up, roasting them, or, um, and then blending that up into a nice coffee-like powder. And then you just boil that. And then you have a really nice tea. And it's great for the winter. Right now is root harvesting season and you can harvest those until the ground freezes. You can still harvest them after the ground freezes. It's just a lot of work. So now is the time to be harvesting those roots. So that's a wonderful, wonderful tea. Very hearty, very nice to drink through the winter. And what I like to do is with that, a mixture of different mushrooms like chaga, reishi, lion's mane, and turkey tail and maitake, which that's a lot, you know. I know we're all we're beginners here, but I, I want to share that excitement of that medicinal mushroom tea. Those are five of the medicinal mushrooms in the Stamets stack, which is like seven different mushrooms, cordyceps, and there's one other. Um, but you can forage all of those in the DC region. And then the other thing is it's not, again, it's not caffeinated, but I just want to give a little shout out to a plant called Yapon Holly, which grows in the Southern United States, which is the only caffeinated plant to this continental, it's on, the only native caffeinated plant to basically continental United States. It, yeah. And it's very closely related. It's a cousin to yerba mate. And so it has the same benefits of green tea, but it's grown right here. And it grows as far north as North Carolina along the coast. And then from Texas all the way through Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, and then Florida, and then parts of South Carolina and North Carolina. So if you ever take a trip down there, you can harvest your caffeine and have a local caffeine source. You can also buy it. It's called Yapon Holly. So, okay, now we've talked about dandelion. Does anybody have any questions on dandelion before we scoot on to the next plant, whichever ones that ends up being? Uh, here? For the, for the roots portion, um, how, like, I'm guessing you rinse off the roots first before you roast them? Mm. So the question is, would I rinse off the roots before roasting them? Depends on how busy I am that day. Um, when you're roasting the roots, you're going to kill any bacteria that's in that soil. So there's no harm in eating, you know, having some of that soil. And it's also going to sit at the bottom of the cup, so it's not going to go into your mouth. Um, so that's a preference, whether you, you know, scrub them down. Most people would probably scrub them down. I may or may not, depending on what I'm up to that day. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Don't die. Does this one have like a look alike? Uh, so, dandelion has quite a few plants that look similar to it, but they're all in the lettuce family. So, you have dandelions, wild lettuce, and then um, thistles. And all thistles, lettuces, and dandelions are edible. Um, and so, some are going to be undesirable, some are going to have thorns and you can see the thorns and not put them into your mouth or put them in your mouth if you want to. But all the, all the thistles are also edible, you can work with those. Um, so, and then chicory looks like it too, but chicory is, you treat chicory just as dandelion. Um, chicory has a ridge of hairs along the bottom. But it doesn't matter, chicory and dandelion, you can eat the leaves in the same way and use the roots. So one of the reasons dandelion is a great plant to start with 
is because it is a, a very easy to identify beginner one. Anything you're finding that, now, okay, one note on that, look-alike depends on how much you're paying attention because there's certainly things that are green and are leaves and are toxic and can kill you. Now, also I'll say there's very few things that can kill you. This whole idea of like being afraid of dying, it's very hard to die. Um, most people who die are people who are just picking up random, most of the time mushrooms, and not having any paying attention and just eating them. Very rarely does a forager actually die from eating a plant. But the, the really toxic plant would be water hemlock and poison hemlock. Those would be like, you know, the, the real, those are the ones that cause some deaths, but 100% avoidable. Um, so dandelion's a very easy one to get started with. One... Dandelion does have latex in it though, as does the other lookalike that you've had. So oh yes. People have latex sensitivities, that's a good one to know about. It's natural latex isn't the same, but if you're super sensitive, that's one to know about. Yeah, I mean, so, oh that's one other thing, another way you can identify dandelion is it does have a latex that comes out of it, which I'm not seeing any coming out of this one right now. It, there's just the tiniest yeah, bit. Him. Yeah. But, um... Yes, so she mentioned a sensitivity to latex. Um, I'm definitely, some people are sensitive to a lot of things. And that's one of the tips of foraging is anytime you're working with a new plant, just try a little bit the first time. That's one of the other really important safety tips is with any new plant, just try a little bit. And ideally, you can be extra safe if you only try one new plant per day because then if you do have a reaction, you'll know what plant you're reacting to. I have tried 15 new plants in a day, so I'm not saying I follow all of these rules, but as beginners, if you wanna play it safest, one new plant a day and always just nibble, you know, a little bit of each plant to start with. Um, but also, you know, do what feels right to you. Like dandelion, they sell it at the grocery store. It's a domesticated crop. I've never heard of anyone having any real reaction to it. So most of the plants that I'm introducing you today, like you can put them into your salad bowl. So that's dandelion. Any last questions on dandelion? So in, like in different plants, will you harvest them differently in terms of how much and the way that you harvest? Sure. Like if they spread by rhizomes or by spreading seeds? Yes. So the question was like, will I harvest different plants differently? And the answer is yes. So if I wanted to harvest a dandelion without damaging the plant, what I would do is I would harvest if there's, well, like from this dandelion plant right here, I would just harvest maybe half of these leaves. But that being said, as I've said, dandelion is also one that you can harvest for the root. And if you're harvesting the root, it means you're pulling up the whole plant. So dandelion is one of those plants that is so abundant that you can absolutely harvest as you desire. Ah, darn it. Now I really want it. <laughs> That's a nice thick dandelion root. Ah. Ah. Anyone got a shovel? <laughs> I'm sure the White House or the Capitol is not too happy about this. I'll cover it back up. So there's a little chunk of dandelion root there. So side, that's a sidetrack from the original question, which was, yes, every plant I'm going to harvest differently. But so far we've been talking about weeds, that there's so much of it that there's not a need to worry about harvesting too much dandelion or things like that. They come back very prolifically. We will see if there's a plant today that I would harvest in smaller quantities, but here on this lawn, you know, again, we're mostly harvesting weeds. But yes, so the key is, like for example, let's talk about wild ramps for a minute. Wild ramps are one of the plants that do sometimes get decimated. There's acre, sometimes acres of it are destroyed. And um, that's from harvesting the bulbs. Generally with ramps, I harvest the leaves and not the bulbs. 
But if I do harvest the bulbs, if there's like 10 in a clump, I'll just harvest like three or four from each clump. And some plants actually thrive on being thinned because the reality is, is that a lot of plants have developed over tens of thousands of, well, yeah, tens of thousands of years with the human beings who lived with them. So when the colonizers came to the United States and they saw, or what we call the United States now, and they saw what they thought was like pure, untouched nature, what they were actually seeing was the indigenous people, the, the forest that they had tended to, and they had made, they had, they had been tending to these, these plants for hundreds or thousands of years, and they were super abundant forests of food by working with the animals and the plants. And so a lot of these plants have developed over many, many, many years along with humanity. So with that being said, there are plants that actually thrive with human interaction. There's plants where when we dig around for the roots, we actually create space for more roots to grow, for example, or for their seeds to fall and germinate. But we can also, by digging, open it up to what are considered invasive plants that can then thrive. So every plant is different and it's about learning to work with them. But again, with these plants that we're doing today, mostly weeds, so less, you know, less important. Okay, so this next plant here is commonly called peppergrass. Um, another name for it is poor man's pepper. And the idea of calling it poor man's pepper is this idea of foraging being something for people in poverty. And that's something that you've seen more and more over the last, you know, 50, 70, 100 years is as the global industrial food system took over and we saw more things like processed foods and, and white bread that's come around in what, the 50s, 60s, there's this uh, negative connotation with foraging that it's only something you would do because you're poor, it is poverty food. And poor man's pepper represents that. It's called poor man's pepper, as in you would only have this if you can't buy black pepper. But my friend Eric Joseph Lewis, he started to call this rich man's pepper, and that's what I call it now too. Because the reality is, is that foraging with the right mindset allows you to access foods that honestly I could never afford. Some days I eat like $300 worth of food. I could never buy the, you know, my Taki or Hen of the Woods that's $30 a pound at the supermarket, but I'll find $200 of that at one tree. So definitely foraging is about taking back, you know, a lot of this, this fear of people looking down on you. I mean, for me to be sitting here on the ground and eating food from the ground is definitely, I like it because it's humbling. It helps me to you know, stay humble and to connect with plants in this way. So I like to call this one rich man's pepper. And it's used as a pepper substitute. Um, if, well, here, we'll pass, we'll pass this around um, and you can all take a little nibble if you wanna pass that around while we're talking about it. So the leaves of peppergrass are edible and the seed heads are, seed pods are edible as well. The seed pods I find to be most desirable when they're green, um, like they are now. And um, it's, again, I mentioned used as a pepper substitute, but if you go into this expecting black pepper, you're going to be disappointed. So instead go into it expecting something else. And I consider this like, more like a wasabi-ish type of flavor. Um, or actually it tastes just like watercress to me, which I love watercress. It's one of my favorite greens, one of my favorite foods. So yeah, I give it a very watercressy flavor. So it's a nice one, you know, right now with me eating 100% food from the land, this is more valuable to me, like adding these flavors. But when I had a garden, and was both growing and foraging all of my food. And I had all the things like coriander and cilantro and basil and uh, thyme and rosemary and, and oregano and all of these. I didn't really go for this. It wasn't so important, but when eating just foraged food, this is a really wonderful one. 
And so you can just use these fresh. I've never actually dried them. I don't know if they hold on to their flavor dry. So I tend to use this as a fresh one. So this is, again, rich man's pepper, poor man's pepper, or pepper grass, and the leaves and the flowers, and you can eat the stalk as well. The stalk is a little more tough, but you can eat it. So that is that plant. Anybody have any questions about this? You said so all of it, you can eat all of it? Yes, okay. uh, not the root, just the above ground area, but the stalk is not something people would generally eat because it's like fibrousy. But if you were like to be efficient, well, again, I don't know if you would dry this because I think you, use, you lose the flavor by drying. But with a lot of herbs like this, I'll dry them and then blend them up, including the, the stem. And then there's just that you know, bit of woodiness because it's, but because it's blended, it doesn't really matter. But this, I don't think that would apply to this because watercress loses its flavor dried. So I think this probably would as well. Um, so yeah. Other questions on this plant? So the next plant that I want to introduce you to is a very small plant right here. Um, oh, here's a nice, nice little patch of rich man's pepper. And next to it is, can anyone recognize this from where you are? It's, it's a small one to be looking at, so it's not the most ideal. It's got these little green berries on it. It's not a horse nettle, but I could see how it looks like that. No, no pokers on it. So I'm going to pick this and bring it over here. So this is a plant that is by many books considered to be highly toxic. Uh, even, you know, by some books considered to be deadly. This is something that is called, some people consider it to be deadly nightshade. But this is not deadly nightshade, this is American nightshade, and it has been eaten by, well, according to Sam Thayer's literature, three billion people around the world actually eat the leaves of this or the berries. So this is black nightshade or American nightshade, and it's often confused with a nightshade from Europe that is toxic, however, you do not generally find that growing very often. I've actually maybe seen it once to my recollection. So um, when this plant is young and tender, the leaves are eaten by millions of people around the world, potentially over a billion people. Africa, parts of Africa and Asia in particular is where I've heard about that. And then the berries, when they are ripe, are edible, not when they're green. So when the berries are ripe, they turn a, like black and they're a shiny black. They have, um, and the, the fruit, so they're a nightshade like tomatoes. And there are a lot of plants that are nightshades that are toxic, potatoes, um, have toxic leaves, although some people do boil them that are, you know, in extreme conditions and they can boil them enough times to remove those toxins and eat them. Um, you know, the leaves of, of peppers and of um, eggplants. So there's some edible nightshades, but a lot of nightshades are toxic. So that being said, this is not a beginner plant, even though billions of people have eaten it, there's a lot of fear around it. So if you have that fear, don't have it be your first plant, you know, wait till later. But how you identify this is the calyxes, which is the little, the little, basically where the berry attaches to the stem, there's a star-shaped calyx. And that is only either smaller than the berry or about the size of the berry, whereas on the toxic nightshade that is much bigger and then the leaves are different there's quite a few differences to them I'm not going to go into all those because this really is more of just an introduction the focus of today is not that you'll be able to identify all of these plants the real focus is I want just for you to inter be introduced to the fact that food is growing all over the place that food is growing freely and abundantly all around us I'm not an expert at really teaching people exactly the details of identifying. 
that's where I would recommend books and you know YouTube channels and going out with other foragers. So on that note, as far as going out with other foragers, the resource that I recommend for that is a database that I created. It's findaforager.com and there's hundreds of foragers listed on there. I'm sure there's some in the DC area, including Eric Joseph Lewis, who lives at Plant Path Nursery up in Knoxville, Maryland. And he's a great person to learn from in this area. So that's a great website if you wanna find a forager to go out with. And that's one of my definite recommendations is to go out with foragers, whether it's in a big group setting like this or in smaller settings. And a lot of foragers are available for hire um, not me. I like to do this just as a, you know, as a service, but a lot of foragers, that's what they do. They take people out foraging. They teach them how to forage. And a lot of times classes are like $30 and by spending $30, you will learn thousands of dollars worth of, of knowledge. So that's a little bit about, uh, the black nightshade. Who knows this one? This, uh, the oak, right? Nope. Very common, like the oak. Yes. Anyone know what kind of maple it is? Sugar maple. It says right here on the sign. Acer saccharum. Um, that's the genus and species. So we're not going to talk for long about sugar maple, but who knows what you can make from the sugar maple. Maple syrup. So I would love to see one of you tap this tree in the spring. If you do, please let me know. I think that would be amazing to tap the sugar maple in front of the U.S. Capitol. Uh, if none of you are going to do it, I may have to take a trip back up here for that. That is uh, around here, probably March. Has anyone ever tapped a maple? Yep. Do you know what time of year that would be? Or was that here? March? Nice. So. Um, just a note on maple, on, uh, maple syrup. So maple syrup comes from the maple tree. There are different maples that you can harvest from, but the sugar maple, aptly named, is the most productive. There's other trees that you can make syrups from as well. Um, to tap the tree, it's a pretty simple, it's a pretty basic thing. Um, and basically you, you have a tap with a metal spigot and then the water flows out of it. It is, it is a, a sustainable thing that you can do. You can harvest maple syrup in a way that doesn't damage the tree. And what you're doing is in the spring when all this water's flowing up, you're, having, you're accessing some of that water and it's got that sugar in it. So it's about a 40 or 60 to one ratio of water to sugar. So you have to boil down a lot of water to get maple syrup, but you can also just drink that maple sap, that maple water straight out of the tree as well, which is a nice experience. So sugar maple, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Oh, so come look at this everyone. So this is all the, this is wood sorrel, but growing like you would see clovers like I showed you how wood sorrel is you know higher up but this is all that little wood sorrel all over here you can see here's a plant of it coming up and here's another plant coming up right here but this is all tiny little wood sorrels so if anybody would like to taste wood sorrel this would be a good opportunity if you want to try that lemoniness go in for a little nibble Take a few leaves. There's plenty. I hear you say that you were so Plantago is actually both the genus and the common name for this plant. So most plants, their you know Latin name, which is you have a genus and a species. This is Plantago major. Most of the time, your common name is not going to be that at all. But um, this happens to have the same common name as his Latin name, Plantago. So there's two species of Plantago around, Plantago major. Oh, goodbye. Well, thank you so much. Nice to see ya. Nice to see you too. <laughs> um, Plantago major and Plantago minor. Plantago minor is going to have leaves that are lanceolate, which means they're like kind of like, like pointy. Um, and then Plantago major has these rounded leaves. And these leaves can get, you know, way bigger and they're in lots of lawns, and it's just kind of ridiculous how hard it is to find Plantago or 
Another name for this is broadleaf plantain or narrowleaf plantain. And they are one of the most common plants across what we call North America. In fact, they're called white man's footprint is another name for them because they came over with the colonizers and they spread all across this land. That being said, there is also a native species and the native species actually has purple on its stem. That's how you know that you have the native one. Either one uh, can be used medicinally the same way uh, as food or as medicine. Um, and same with the narrow leaf plantain. So let's see. So normally you'll find this in huge quantities and it's just so ironic that there's none of it here, uh, you know, uh, on this lawn. I'm really surprised because we found lots of other, you know, weeds, but for some reason this one's just not around. But um, one way to identify this is that it's got these very, very, um, the, the veins are very prominent, very pronounced veins. You can see those there. And when you, when you rip this apart gently, often those veins will actually stay together. That didn't, didn't quite happen, but you can see that one vein came outside. Can you see that back there? There's like this one little vein sticking out. It's pretty small. Let me see if I can do this one. No, it doesn't always do it. I like to think it looks like celery. The veins, yeah, veins of celery, yeah. There you could see a few veins. So that's one of the um, sort of identifying things about it. You'll see this plant is all over. And so how, how I work with Plantago is like the others, I put this into, into horta, the, you know, sautéed greens with lemon and salt. And um, then this is often used as a, so this is considered to be one of the most medicinal plants here in North America. There's so many medicinal plants. There's many most medicinal plants, but this is considered to be one of them. And so this is one of those being your food, being your medicine for sure. But the other commonly thing done with this is you just, so if I get stung by a bee, because I'm a beekeeper, well, you can get stung by a bee if you're not a beekeeper, but if you're a beekeeper, you're more likely to get stung by bees more often. What I do is I'll chew up a bunch of leaves, give it a good chewing, and then where I got stung, like if I was stung right here, I'll take that, and this is called a poultice, and I'll put that nice green juiciness right onto the sting. And in herbalism, they say that this draws out the toxins. I don't know if exactly what it's doing, but what I've found is that if I do this after getting stung by a honeybee, if I do it within a couple of minutes, I barely swell at all, and if I don't, sometimes I swell up like big, because I have what's called an extreme local reaction. So if I get stung right here, like I've had both my eyes closed. I'm not having like an allergic reaction like that's, you know, could close up my throat. It's only local. But by doing this, it cannot swell hardly at all. So it's a wonderful medicine. And you can do it fresh or um, you can dehydrate it and then mix it with honey and then put that as a paste on there. And you like to keep it on for a good half hour or so, either way. And then with the honey stuff, you can just lick it right off afterwards. So it's a tasty medicine as well. And I didn't show a good example of it, but, well, let me see if I can do a little better of a job. Because what you want to do, so I'm taking like four leaves, I give it a nice chewing. Okay. So, there. Now see that nice green juice coming out of there? Like, I'll see if I can drip it down. Like, you see how green that is? You've like chewed the green out of the leaves and that's a poultice. So that's a very simple medicine that we can make just with our own mouth, our own saliva, and the plants growing around us. 
Yeah, so this is used for other irritations. I wouldn't say it would be one for, for poison ivy. Another name for poison ivy is sister ivy because we don't call each other by our bad characteristics as humans. So it's a way to, you know, have more positive association with plants. Um, so I tend to call it sister ivy. But uh, I don't know of it being used for sister ivy or poison ivy, but it's definitely for, for any stings or scratches and things like that, it can be beneficial for those. Other questions on plantago or plantain? And it's not related to like plantains like the banana. Don't know why it has that same name. Yes? Yes. Narrow leaf plantain, broad leaf plantain, native or non-native all can be used in the same ways. And again, you'll find huge amounts of this and sometimes the leaves are like this big. Like they can get, actually I've seen leaves like that big in gardens. You can grow it in your garden, um, but it grows all over. Also noting that the seed heads are also edible. And what I like to do with the seeds is actually um, like fry them up and they make a nice uh, garnish on your salad as well. And when the seed heads are young and you can like bite right through the stem, the whole seed head is edible. And then when they're older, that's when you strip the seeds off and then you can fry those up for a garnish on your salad dressing. So the next plant I want to talk about here is oak. So this is a white oak. There's over, there's about a hundred species of oaks in what we call the United States. And oak is one of the most important plants to humanity. So many of the indigenous people of what we call California uh, were acorn people. Up to 50% or more than 50% of their calories, their food was the acorn. People have existed off of acorn. Um, one way that you know how powerful it is, is there's very few foods where the name of the food is different from the plant itself. The oak, the acorn. And so that shows just how important of a food this has been to humanity. There aren't really acorn people today because um, the food culture has been stolen or lost over the last hundreds of years by most indigenous people. So there aren't people that live on acorns today still, but they still are an incredibly important food. What's ironic about them is they are one of the most important foods to humanity still because of a lot of the animals that eat them. So deer and pigs and you know, a lot of the animals that are still eaten today by people are largely subsisting on acorns a lot of the times. Um, but what's so ironic about it is that it's such an important food, but 99% of people will just, you know, they'll see them on the sidewalk and they'll just step over them or drive their cars over them on the road and never realize how incredible of a food source they are. I don't consider acorns to be beginner foraging just because they require some processing. And so how you process acorns is you break them out of their shell and then you grind them up, break them up, and you put them in either boiling water. I guess there's a squirrel up there. You put them in either boiling water or cold water. And what you're doing there is you're leaching the tannins out. So acorns are toxic raw. Now you can absolutely eat an acorn or a couple acorns raw, no problem. They're just really high in tannins. And tannins can actually be beneficial for us. But if you're eating acorns as a sustenance or any, you know, any amount really besides just tasting some, then you need to remove the tannins. And you can do that through a hot bath or through a cold bath. And through a hot bath, you, you basically are boiling out the tannins through a cold bath, you have to do more water changes, but you don't have to use the, you know, the electricity or the, or the, or the, uh, you know, the natural gas or the gas. And so how it works is you're removing the tannins that are water soluble. And after a certain number of baths, depending on the tree type, you'll be left with acorn mash, which can be eaten just like that and is wonderful or you can dry that out and turn it into acorn flour and then you can add that in with your breads and your muffins and you know 
all sorts of things like that. So acorns are a wonderful staple food. If you want to like live off the land from foraged food, acorns are you know, one of your best friends. They are an incredible resource and there's so much food that can come from them. So there is a black walnut tree at the end of this park and it is the one with the, well, it actually is labeled because it was devoted to someone. So if you walk down this sidewalk on your way out, you'll see a tree that has a plaque on it and you can read it and it says black walnut. And black walnut has the leaves that are basically sort of small and it's, it's like, it's what's called a leaf lit. So it's a leaf that has many little leaves on it. And they, black walnut produces a green husk. And I wish I had some of those with me, but it's a green husk that's about like this big, a round ball. It's got a real unique smell to it. If you pick it up and scratch it, it's got a strong smell to it. And so you'll find, if you start to look, you'll see black walnut growing all over the place. And inside of those husks is the walnut shell. And inside of the shell is the nut. Does anybody happen to have a hammer? All right, so there's no hammer, so there's no way we're getting this open right now. I would have loved to have opened one to show you, but inside of this is the nut meat. And so black walnut is something that you can harvest in large quantities and you can eat it really pretty easily. Like you could just go out and experiment with this tomorrow or tonight. And so how you remove the husk, you can just, oop, acorn falling. You can just, um, leave the, the, the nuts in the husk out to rot for like a couple weeks and the husk will rot right off. Or you can just put them in a bag and smash that in the ground, on the ground to get the stuff off. You can either wait or you can do it more rapidly. And then you're left with, you'll have the, the shells. These can store for years. So you can hold on to these for years and just crack them open through the winter. And then you can just eat the nut meat directly out of these. They're generally better after letting them sit like this for a couple of months. Um, not in the heat, like in your basement or in your pantry or something like that. The flavor tends to improve. Um, they are generally most desired for being used in baking rather than eating fresh. They have a flavor that people don't, a lot of people don't love. Um, so, but they're prized for baking. In fact, you can even buy black walnut at the store. Okay. And I just mentioned ginkgo, which is from Japan. Also from Japan, Japanese is the first word. Does that help anyone? Japanese knotweed. Have any of you heard of that? So this is considered to be a highly invasive plant. Um, one thing I just want to say about invasive plants is, um, well, two things. The plant itself is not evil. They've been taken away from their normal existence most of the time by humanity, often placed there intentionally by humanity and then vilified. So the plant itself is not inherently bad or evil. Now, one of the great things we can do to reduce invasives is we can actually eat them. Unlike a lot of people who just spray them with pesticides, my way of turning, of working with invasives is to actually eat them. In permaculture, there's a saying, and that is the problem is the solution. Japanese knotweed is the problem, turn it into dinner as a solution. So the last 30 days, I've, I've eaten 100% food that I've foraged myself, and this is gonna be my first food that I didn't forage. This was given to me by a wonderful forager named Isa in New Haven. And these are Japanese knotweed that she foraged in apple cider vinegar. So this is my first food now that the month is over. And I've never had knotweed before either. So this is a new food too. Yay. Incredibly underwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> but um, what's the texture? Let's pass it around. Everybody have one that would like to. <laughs> Stick your fingers in there. I, I really I don't mind. So it's all everybody here is 
a human being who can make their own choices of whether or not to stick their fingers in there and eat one. But there is one for everyone. No, it's good. But as far as the first food... <laughs> I mean, I, I think the apple cider vinegar... Is stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Mmm. Actually, it's getting a little better. So, um... So that's, Jap that's not weed. It's definitely one to get to know. You eat the shoots of that in the spring. And it's, a des it's definitely desirable. Ooh! <laughs> so, um, on that note, I would like to just share two things. Whoa, the squirrels are getting active. <laughs> I'd just share, like to share two things before we finish for the evening, and then um, I'll then, well, okay. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, this whole month of eating 100% from the land and being here and talking about plants, I would not be doing this if it was just about plants. I mean, I love plants and it's wonderful to harvest our food from the land. But for me, this is about so much more. This is about taking back power from a broken food system and about creating equitable, just, regenerative food systems. Food systems where when we eat, we're actually giving back to the earth rather than taking from the earth. And so this is also about taking our power back in knowing that we can find our food and our medicine growing around us and that we don't need to have everything wrapped in plastic, shipped around the world, and that by connecting with, with ourselves and with the resources around us, we can learn the skills that we need in order to break free from exploitative, oppressive systems and exist in a way that is actually beneficial to the earth. And then for me, there's two things that I've really gathered over the last uh, 10 years. I just realized that was sort of like a pun. I'm not really a pun guy. Gathered, foraging, but anyway. So there's two things that I've really gathered over the last 10 years of, or so of activism and just reconnecting with the earth and uh, as far as solutions to the world's problems. And number one is community. These systems are really designed to, you know, we look at U.S. American society and it's a system of individualism where the idea is we all earn the dollar and then we can all buy everything we need or pay for whatever service we need and then we don't need anybody else. Independence. And we, st we act like that as an American society as well that we don't need anybody else and that the American society is the most important. But to me, I believe the solution to, our, to that is really community. The idea of independence, I think we're coming to see, is an illusion. You know, with the seven or eight billion people that exist on this world, we realize that actually this is a tiny little earth that we live on, as Carl Sagan calls it, a pale blue dot. And everybody on this earth is ultimately our neighbor. So now that we know the earth is so small, we realize that we have to work together as a community in order to be able to solve our problems. And so for me, community is us that's here together. It's us as a nation. It's us with all of our global neighbors, but we also need to work together as a community with our plant and animal relatives. So my belief is that most of our problems can be solved through community, coming together, sharing our skills, our knowledge, our resources, and by doing that we can break free from the things that don't serve our best interest as a society and as individuals. And then the other thing for me is it comes down to biodiversity and diversity. So when you look at ecosystems that still function and amazingly through all of the destruction that humanity has done, the earth still is here still turning, still producing these acorns, even on the U.S. Capitol lawn. How much food did we just find? Uh, and I don't even know all of it by any means. This is just me, a guy who's been doing this for five years and what we were able to find in this day. So all ecosystems that are truly functioning are functioning through millions, well, in each an ecosystem, thousands or tens of thousands of species interacting in millions and billions of different ways. That is the de definition of biodiversity. And my belief is that biodiversity is the solution to our problems as far as having a resilient earth. And it's also in our gardens. When we grow hundreds of different plants, they work together. When there's a pest that eats, that's eating the kale, it's okay because 
we have 98 or 99 different plants that we can be eating. And the same goes for humanity. When a society tries to say there's just one right way of doing things and everything else is wrong, that's the opposite of diversity. And so to me, diversity is a diversity of thoughts, a diversity of different ways of coming about things and learning how we can work together. And sure, there's ways that we're not going to get along and we're not going to agree with each other, but learning how we can compassionately communicate with each other and through embracing that diversity and that community, you know, figure out these problems that we have and find the solutions for how we can all get along on this beautiful earth that we call home. So I'm grateful for all of you being here today and taking time to get to know some of our plant relatives and learning more about how we can reconnect to the earth and break free from consumerism and capitalism and colonialism and uh, just live joyous, wonderful lives together. And the last note is that equally important as medicine for plants is hugs. 12 hugs a day keeps the doctor away, so I love hugs and I'm happy to share with everyone who would like and also hug each other. Hugs are great! And even if you do a 30 second hug, it supposedly like tunes your rhythm in and like just releases stress and anxiety. Look at all the medicine we have right inside of, our, inside of ourselves just with hugs. So, I love you all very much and I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Oh, we got a hug. <laughs> nice.